You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by His power, just as He raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joined himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Hey everyone, and welcome to Advent season. That's right, we are on the countdown to Christmas. And speaking of Christmas, I've mentioned this before, as one of the ways we want to celebrate Christmas as a church, we want to get connected. We want to get to know people in the church better. We want to spend some time with them. So on December 11th, we are asking that you consider getting together with someone else. It could be for a walk outside, could be for a coffee, could be for breakfast, but it's a Saturday. And just go ahead and get to know someone. I've already made uh, an appointment for my wife and I with another wonderful family in the church, and we're going to have breakfast together that day. I hope that you have made your plans as well. Don't sit back and wait to be asked. Just go ahead and ask someone in the church, especially someone that you wouldn't normally spend time with. So that being said, Let's get into the message today. Now imagine that you came into a large group of people and the uh, leader stood up at the mic and said, today, everyone, we're going to play a game. And you're thinking, oh no, hopefully not Monopoly. No, he said, we're going to play a game. And already the, the extroverts are like, oh boy, goody, goody, a game. And the introverts are already taking fake, fake phone calls on the way out the door, man. Like they're gone. But he says, we're going to play a game. I want you to break into pairs. Already, this is like uncomfortable for, for introverts. He says, we're going to break into pairs. And I want you to share the deepest, darkest truth that you've tried your hardest to hide all your life. I want you to just share that. This is like truth or dare without the dare. I just want you to tell the truth. Now, most of us would not be interested in that game. It's not even much of a game. It's, it's because it breaks a very basic human principle, which is that intimacy and security go together. Intimacy and security go together. You're not going to be vulnerable and intimate with someone that you don't feel safe with, someone you barely know, someone you just met. That's not probably going to happen. It's a principle that is true in friendships. It's true in workplaces. It's true in churches, in families and in marriage couples. Now, many of us watching this, many of us have broken this principle. We have, and it cost us. We may have done it decades ago. We may have done it days ago, but we've broken this principle. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about how we've done that and how it cost us. We started off this series with a question. You know, the big story series, we started off with a question, why does God care so much about sex. When you look at the sin lists in the New Testament, sex is often listed right at the top as being this, this grievous sin to God. The question is why? Why is it listed so often? So in order to answer that question, we started off this series talking about identity and how we get our identity from God. Unlike our culture that says you need to find your identity, 
followers of Jesus get their identity in their relationship with God. Then we talked about how God made us in his image and how that creates an equality, how, how he created us different from everything else in all creation. You, humans are unique. And then we talked about how God's purpose for every human was the Hebrew word yada, to know, to experience intimately. Then we talked about how God uses symbols throughout the big story. We talked about how God is covenantal, how he loves to make covenants. And we talked last week about the purpose of marriage. This week, we are talking about sex. Yep, this is the sex talk. And I got to tell you right up front, if the topic of sex makes you uncomfortable, this may be a message you want to just stop right now and go do something else because we are going to be talking about sex. Now, in the first in the first message of this series, I briefly outlined some historic views of sex that have influenced our, our thinking today. The first one is realism. This came from the Greeks and Romans, and they said that sex is just an appetite. It's like eating, you know, so because it's like eating, I mean, don't overdo it or anything, but it's inevitable that you're going to, you know, want to eat. You're going to want to have sex. Just, you know, like I said, don't overdo it. And so people were encouraged to have a, a, a wide variety of cuisines and, and tastes according to your desire, according to your appetite, whatever it may be. They would have said it's unrealistic to not eat. And so it's unrealistic to not have sex. In fact, it's harmful to not satisfy whatever cravings that you have. And this is very much like most of modern day sex ed where sex is seen as neutral, as meaningless, and inevitable. Then there's Plato. And Plato uh, had this weird divide of the self between the spirit and the body. And the spirit was seen as superior and pure, and the body was kind of seen as, as dirty. And because sex involved the body, sex was seen as kind of dirty. And if you've ever come across someone who kind of has that idea that sex is dirty, that's not from the Bible, that's from Plato, okay? And some of you grew up in that culture. I grew up in that culture. Now, another view is the romantic view, where sex is a means towards goodness, where, you, where sex is the release of your primal and most basic instincts, which are considered to be pure. And it's a means towards fulfillment. Where, and the rightness or wrongness of sex is purely determined by how much love there is between the participants. And it has a strong following today, even in the church, where you might hear people say, as long as you love the person, love means love. That's all it's about is love. If you love that person, then sex is okay. And you must follow your desires in, in this view of sex. You must follow your sexual desires to be authentic to be true to yourself because what's in you is good and it needs to be released. Now, the Victorians, they said, no, the exact opposite. What's good, what's inside of you is garbage. And if you got sexual desire, it, it should be repressed. So it's the exact opposite. Now, fortunately, the Bible adheres to none of these views. The Bible's view of sex is so much greater than any one of these. So, but what is the biblical view of sex? I'm so glad you asked. Let's dive in. And the first point may surprise you, especially if you're really new to the faith. This may really surprise you. And that is sex is encouraged. That's right. Sex is encouraged. Now, sex is seen to need definite boundaries. It, it's seen like a, 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 like a Mack truck, which has the potential to do great good and also great harm. And so there needs to be boundaries around this. And you know what? Almost everyone you'll talk to says sex needs boundaries. They do. I almost meet no one who thinks that every sexual expression is good and right. Everyone draws the line somewhere. And so sex in the Bible is designed for the legal and binding covenant marriage between one man and one woman for life. And we saw why last week. But let's get into something that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And this may come as an absolute shocker to you. Here it is. The husband should fulfill 
his wife's sexual needs. Didn't see that coming, did you? And it's not a surprise to me that Paul starts with the husband, you need to fulfill your wife's sexual needs. You got a job to do. And then to keep things equal, he says, and the wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. Then he goes on. He says, the wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Absolute equality in this relationship. He says, so do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Shocking to those who think the Bible is down on sex. This is actually saying, no, you, you, need, to have, you need to have regular sex. And in, right in the middle of the Bible is a, is a book called the Song of Songs, which is dedicated to sexual expression. And surprisingly, in that book, most of it is the wife seeking after her husband, pursuing, initiating sex. So the question is not, does the Bible encourage married couples to have sex? It does. The real question before us today is why? Now, let me ask you, if you're a long-term churchgoer, you've been a believer for some time, and someone came to you and said, why does the Bible encourage married couples to have sex? What would you say? Hmm, would you be stymied by that question? Well, let's keep going, and you're going to discover the reason. Number two, sex is purposeful. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not going to break into some diatribe about how sex is for the purpose of procreation because I'll tell you, the vast majority of sex out there between married couples is not creating babies and they don't want it to create babies, right? So, so, so you say, okay, I know, Se the purpose of sex is pleasure. It's, you know, for some, it's the only exercise you're going to get all week, right? You know, it's just this fun activity. You know, she may not like his heavy metal music, and he may not like her home renovation shows, but sex, oh, that's a hobby they can agree on. It's fun for none of the rest of the family, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, and in the scripture reading, that in that whole section, Paul talks about uh, a saying that was going on in their society. It's, food was made for the stomach and stomach for food. It's kind of similar, like, to love is love, you know? But this saying was not about food. It was about sexual appetite. It's another way of saying genitals are for sex and sex is for genitals. Enjoy. Well, there you go. That's, that's Plato. You know, sex is basically, uh, you know, kind of, anyway, it, dirty and, and all that sort of thing. But, uh, but this is, goes back to, uh, Paul continues on. He says, you can't say, though he's talking to believers now, he says, you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. And you might recall from the first message that sexual morality, when you see that in your Bibles, in your modern day Bibles, that's the Greek word porneia. And porneia is the word that the biblical writers used to describe all sex outside of marriage as described in Leviticus 20. He says, you can't say that our bodies were, were made for porneia. He goes on, he says, don't you realize, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ. Should a man, and he uses a man in this example, he says, should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it, unite it to a prostitute? Never. He says, never. That shouldn't happen. He says, and don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one. He becomes one body with her. And then he goes back to the original formula, the original marriage formula. He says, this is not the way it's supposed to work. He goes back to Genesis 2. He says, for the scriptures say in Genesis 2, the two are united into one. Now listen carefully to what he's saying. This is crucial. He is equating sex outside of marriage, and prostitution would be like first century Tinder today, uh, to, to joining, to uniting, to a oneness. The purpose of sex is to bond a couple, to make two into one. Sex is the reaffirmation of marriage vows, the marriage covenant. It is saying all of me for all of you. It is a literal bearing of yourself to give yourself entirely to them. And sex is so powerful, like that Mack truck I talked about, so powerful that when a couple engages in 
in casual sex, these two people who barely know each other end up after sex saying the dumbest thing to each other. Like, I love you. I want to dedicate myself to you. I, I can't imagine my life without you. Because they've, they've toyed with something that's powerful that's not meant for them. It was meant for a covenant marriage. And this is the game that we talked about at the beginning of this message. This is that truth game where people are bearing their souls without the security in the relationship. See, sex outside of marriage is vulnerability without security. It's stupid in a game, as we you probably would have said, that was stupid in that game, but why is it perfectly acceptable in the bedroom? It's a violation of that basic principle that intimacy requires security. That bearing requires safety. Now, as I said before in another message, I said some people catch on to this. And once they've been hurt a few times in this whole casual sex thing, and they, they've bonded as one, and then they've broken apart and bonded as one and broken apart, they say, I I'm tired of the hurt and pain that comes from that. And so I'm going to steal myself from that pain from that power of sex, that bonding part of sex. I'm going to galvanize myself. I'm going to become invulnerable to those things and protect myself, my emotions, my thoughts, my will. And then over time, it weakens that mechanism that is meant to create a bond, that's create, meant to create that oneness. And when they do find someone they do want to become one with and have a, a covenant relationship with, they find it hard to have intimacy because they become so good at protecting themselves from the hurt and pain of bonding with someone through sex. I wonder how many married couples watching this are haunted by their sexual past and have trouble creating intimacy with their current partner because of it. Good news is God can help all of that. Trust me, he can. So now Paul begs the church, he says begs the church to keep sex inside of marriage, to avoid that oneness without commitment, to avoid the lie, the lie that says, you can have my body, but that's it. I will not commit myself to you legally, financially, emotionally, socially, or intellectually. I will main, maintain control. I will maintain independence from you. You cannot have intimacy without commitment, without mutual trust. Sex is designed to renew the vows of marriage. Some of you have participated in marriage renewal ceremonies, which is all fine. It's just not biblical because God already built in a, a renewal of vows ceremony. It's called sex. In sex, you are saying all of me for all of you in an exclusive, legal, and permanent covenant. Now, why regular sex? Why would Paul write to the church and say, you know, uh, that, that couples should have sex? I mean, come on, Paul, get out of the bedroom. Why, why are you all up in married people's business and saying you need to create some heat in the sheets? You know, like what's going on here? Well, in one word, it's insecurity because that safety and intimacy fades over time. In a, in a marriage relationship, you may feel completely loved one minute, and then you're questioning the next minute after one look, one slight disagreement, one comment, one tiny little bit of neglect, and you need that affirmation. You need to know that your spouse really wants to be with you, that they are still committed to their vows, to love, to honor, to cherish, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for as long as they live. They need, you need to know that they are committed, body, mind, and soul, and strength, everything. And this is what sex is meant to do. It's meant to affirm, to cement, to renew those vows. But your experience may be different from that. You may be saying, well, then why do I feel so empty after sex? Why do I feel so alone, so used, so broken? You know, it's, it's really tragic today that sex is referred to as love making. It may be better to refer to it as love 
giving because our culture rates how good sex is by how good it is for you. How, what you receive from it. But intimate sex comes from how good you make it for the other person. Where giving pleasure is the pleasure. That is the best sex. Orgasm not required. It's a way of serving. It's a way of affirming. It's a way of making the other person feel safe enough. Listen now. It's a way of making the other person feel safe enough to be vulnerable where intimacy and oneness can flourish. When a couple goes too long without sex, and it varies from couple to couple, doubts begin to creep in. Insecurities begin to rise. Suddenly, without warning, the wife is annoyed about this rug that's not vacuumed and the husband is miffed that she switched coffee brands without you know, consulting him. And, and the, the, the tension is not about those things. The tension is about intimacy, security, affirmation. It's about covenant. It's asking the big questions. Do you still love me? Are you still totally committed to me? And that complete commitment is found only in love giving. No, please don't under, misunderstand. Sex does not fix everything. That's not my point. I said sex is purposeful, not all powerful. Now, if you're a single person and you're watching this and you're, and you're thinking, man, this is like nothing to do with me, I do have a message coming up for you singles because you fit into the big story in a major way and I want to make sure that you get your due. Let's go on to point number three which is sex is prophetic. Last week we talked about how marriage is a symbol, it's a sign, it's a marker to our purpose. Marriage was not designed for societal stability as some are, uh, allege. Although it does do that, it directs us to our ultimate destiny, which is yada, that Hebrew word that means to know God intimately. And one day, it says at the end of the book, that the church and God will be united to complementary, similar but different, agents joining in a covenant union in the ultimate wedding. Now, I get that this is a major stretch for some of you, especially if you are not even sure there is a God. But at the same time, you're looking around at our society and you're thinking, something's not quite right here. After years, after decades of sexual experimentation, with fewer and fewer boundaries encouraged, people are lonelier than ever, more broken, more searching, more hurting. It seems harder to keep a marriage together. And you want to know why. And maybe you've seen or experienced the emptiness in casual sex. Now, if marriage itself has meaning beyond this life, and it's not the ultimate, then sex must as well. Because sex is prophetic. See, within the safety and beauty of marriage, of a marriage covenant between one man and one woman for life, sex renews that marriage covenant and invites intimacy within vulnerability. It projects us forward to how the big story is going to end. And it's going to end, listen, listen, listen. It's going to end with you and I falling into the arms of our true spouse. Our true soulmate, you might say. The one who loves us more than anyone else. Now, I just want you to think for one moment. When sex is selfless and giving, and the best sex is, as we already looked at, your focus in that moment is only on that one other person. You are not thinking about COVID. You are not thinking about flooding. You're not thinking about work the next day. Nothing else matters in that moment. You feel completely safe and cared for. That feeling, that feeling is a foreshadow, an allegory, a symbol of the time when you will fall into the arms, the safety, 
the security and overwhelming love of God himself. And when that happens, nothing will distract you. He will have your undivided attention and you will have his. Here's the thing. The best sex today that's happening on this planet right now will be put to shame, will be just a shadow, a whisper of the intimacy that we will encounter then, the safety that we will experience, the affirmation and connection we will encounter because security and intimacy go together. We've looked at that throughout this message. Security and intimacy go together. So when you have maximum security and there's no safer place than being in God's arms, it will lead to the ultimate intimacy, the ultimate vulnerability. You know, I've, I've talked to so many Christians who despair of their sexual desire. They think it's some kind of dirty part of them, but that's Plato. Sexual desire is God given. And if I could just be so blunt for just one moment, Our sexual desire is God-given, and it's not orgasm we're looking for. It's not. You can take care of that on your own. It's connection. It's intimacy. It's love. It's oneness that our heart really wants. You are not an animal run by instincts. You are a relational and an eternal being created in God's image. Sexual desire is an ultimate longing which goes far beyond the physical now to a relationship that is supremely fulfilling in the future. So, sex is a big deal because God made it to be a powerful symbol of God's whole plan for us. Nothing directs us to our final destination of what that will feel like, what that will feel like, than sex, giving sex inside a binding covenant marriage between one man and one woman. No wonder this incredibly powerful symbol has been distorted, how this gift, this sign has been turned into a God itself. See, outside of a marriage covenant, listen carefully, listen. Outside a marriage covenant, sex is a lie. It is saying, I'm dedicated to you. You have everything of mine, but you don't mean it. You're still maintaining control. You're still maintaining independence. It creates a distortion of reality where you're going to feel bonded to someone but you're not really bonded to them. You're still independent. You're going to feel close to someone, but you're not. You're still self-protected from them. You may end up being bonded to people who are no good for you, that you don't want to be bonded to long-term. And it it can create an inability for intimacy later when you do finally want to dedicate yourself. Here's the worst lie. You can have intimacy without covenant. That's the lie. You can have intimacy without covenant with me and with God. That's the lie. And we're going to explore that in a couple weeks. But inside the safety of covenant, sex creates and builds intimacy because safety and intimacy go together. In Tim Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage, he said these great words. He says, sex is the most ecstatic, breathtaking, daring, scarcely to be imagined look at the glory that is our future. It's not here. It's not now. It's directing us to something in the future. And here's the thing. Sex can be truth or it can be a lie. It's either the truth or a lie about our relationship to each other you know, am I totally dedicated to you? Can we have intimacy without commitment? It, it can be the truth or lie about God. Can we have intimacy with God without covenant, without commitment? And is it the truth or a lie about our ultimate destiny? About our purpose as human beings? See, sex or truth, sex can be either truth or a lie. 
And that is why God cares so much about sex. We tell a story when we have sex. It's a true story or it's a lie. And God is a God of truth. And that's why when we tell a lie with our bodies, it is an affront to Him. And it misdirects our hearts. It misdirects the heart of the person that we're having sex with. And it misdirects all the people around us who see us doing this, pretending like we have intimacy without covenant. It's a lie. And you can't have intimacy with God without covenant. Without a covenant that is exclusive and legal and permanent. This is why God cares so much about sex. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this gift that you've given us that ultimately points us towards you. And the feeling that we will have to have, have our undivided attention on you and you on us. And in that rapturous moment of, of safety, we will have an intimacy that we've never experienced before. Lord, I want to pray for all those who are watching this, who've told a lie with sex. It may be yesterday, it may be years and years ago. Lord, would you touch their hearts and let them know that yes, this was wrong. Yes, this needs to be repented of. And that yes, they can find healing in Jesus Christ. Lord, we are grateful that you can forgive us all our sins, all our sins, and that we can have a covenant relationship with you. This is our future. This is our destiny. And we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everyone.